I, I come from a foodie family. My grandfather was a chef. My grandmother was a gardener. My mom cooked meals. I ate meals at the dinner table every night. And food kept coming up as something important to me. At the time, there was a lot of uh, information surfacing about uh, McDonald's and fast food places and diabetes and obesity and uh, issues of that nature. And I thought, I'll become a food critic. And I'll go to restaurants and I'll critique food. So I started doing that. I was on unemployment and I quickly realized that the restaurants that people read about were ones I couldn't afford. And I started thinking about social stratification and the fact that I'm being weeded out from the restaurants that I'd want to write about. Kind of bummed me out. <laughs> and I started thinking about fast food. My kid would not go to McDonald's with me. And I wouldn't take him anyway, but he wouldn't go. It was so even my kids understood that they didn't like fast food. And then I learned about a group called Slow Food, which is an international movement. And Deborah Madison, who lives in this state, who is, um, she worked at, uh, on a Buddhist monastery. She was their food person. And in the, um, early 80s, she opened a restaurant called Greens in San Francisco, and it was a vegetarian place. She wrote an article in one of the local food magazines, Local Flavors, I think it was, and it was about slow food, and, and it just lit me up. It was kind of like I discovered something that really resonated with me about food being a pleasure and a joy, and that uh, uh, food is essential and um, it should be celebrated, all these kinds of uh, uh, socioeconomic related ideas around food, organic, local, and I saw that and I thought, this is awesome. And I started uh, looking into it. And as I was thinking about social stratification, my own relationship with food, my family history, uh, I, it was like the clouds parted and there was a ray of light and I had this moment where I conceived of the nature of the human species and as a species, all we've done for the entire length of our existence on the planet is eat. And we do it every day, without fail, or we die. So it's not negotiable. It, and it is an activity that dominates our existence at every level. And this realization uh, um, required that I pursue various elements to fully understand it. Um, there's something called systems thinking. I, I have a MPA, and uh, a lot of that was involved with uh, leadership and systems thinking, uh, Peter Sange, the fifth discipline. Um, and systems thinking is approaching things holistically and not uh, fragmenting things and uh, separating them out, but like sort of being all-inclusive and embracing the entire system. And I realized that in academia, food is uh, a, a compartmentalized, segmented into nutrition, anthropology, sociology. There are all these medicine, uh, uh, history, religion, linguistics. There, it's all uh, separated out, and to really understand food and its uh, a magnitude and complexity requires an interdisciplinary approach. And, and I started uh, dedicating myself to the research of food as a system. 
Um, and, and it was mind-boggling, and it still is. And I've been doing this for 16 years, and I haven't exhausted it by any means. I, I consider myself still a novice. And one of the things I started doing is I started identifying other people that thought this way, other people that wrote about food from the different disciplines, and, and <coughs> researching, and reading, and studying. Back then, in the uh, early 2000, um, there was a public access TV station in Albuquerque called Channel 27, and I started a food show, and I started interviewing local people. So I started in the neighborhood interviewing farmers, interviewing nutritionists, interviewing anthropologists, people from the university, and I started this process just by talking to people and asking them. And here, here's the, the reason that I asked you to fill out these uh, forms, this questionnaire, is because each of you has a relationship with food. And that's the amazing thing about food, is that it's individual and it's collective. I was required to go places I never thought that I would go and do things I never thought I'd, I'd do. I, I went to the American Dairy Goat Association convention, okay, which is, you know, three years before I started this, it was the last place I thought I'd go. I've been to the Weston Price Conference. Have you ever heard of Weston Price? One of the phenomena about the food world is that uh, uh, people did research in the 20s and 30s, and it's kind of like a generation forgot them. And there are these gaps in the continuity of information. And Weston Price was a dentist, and he was the head of the American Dental Association for a while. And he <coughs> observed that kids that he was seeing had cavities. And he noticed that there was this that there was a change in the way that the cavities occurred, that the earliest kids he saw didn't have this. So this was something that happened over time while he was being a dentist. And he intuited that it was a dietary phenomenon. And what he did, he set out to observe people all around the world and examine their teeth. And he went to uh, um, Africa, South America, Asia. And what's amazing about his, uh, his uh, research is that he took photographs. So you can see the teeth, and you can see the evidence. And what he discovered was that the people that maintained their traditional diets, their teeth were fine. And the people that were colonized and had switched over from their traditional diet to a, a Western diet, European, American diet, they had trouble. And one of the things he found is not only did they have trouble, but their skeletons didn't develop the same way. And crooked teeth is a phenomena of diet, not of genetics. Now what's interesting about this is that I have crooked teeth. And I always wondered why. And it's not because of genetics, it's because my mom was a child during the Depression, and she suffered from malnutrition, and, I, and it carries over a generation. And that those people that ate the Western diets, when they reverted back to their traditional diets, their, their elongated skulls, broadened again, and there was enough room in their jaws for their teeth to straighten up. And, and I found this tremendously provocative. Um, the human species is a hyper-social species. We are closer to ants and bees and termites than to whales or dolphins. And it's this hyper-social nature that uh, distinguishes us. 
as a species, and we got big brains, okay, and we walk upright, but our origins are mammalian primates, which are apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, gorillas, orangutans. These are our cousin species as primates, and they all have complex social relations. but we're upright, and they're not. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back 7 million years and chart a, a super rapid uh, a, a transition from uh, our jungle, Central Africa uh, past to, to the present. Okay, And, and th this is what my quest has led me to as I pull the different threads on the food fabric. This is a footnote. This has nothing to do with food. But uh, um, the word woof and weft, you know, for weaving, in Greek, one is feminine and the other is masculine. So that the fabric is the uh, unity of the sexes. I don't know why that's important, I just like that. <laughs> okay, so, seven million years ago, our ancestors uh, uh, were tree animals, which is why we have toes on our feet, because they were uh, grasping and they were able to climb, and they were vegetarians, and our um, our ancestors uh, uh, did not eat meat. They were, if they needed protein, gorillas, the way gorillas uh, uh, consume protein is bugs. They mostly eat leaves, okay? They're, they're uh, vegetarians, they need some protein, they're bugs, okay? And they're sort of accidental. It's not like they seek the bugs out, but they're just bugs in their environment. And uh, one of the reasons for the big gut with uh, the uh, gorillas is because they need that much digestive oomph to, uh, to uh, um, break down the uh, foliage that they eat. The, uh, the chimps, the bonobos, they will uh, um, forage. They'll go around looking for fruit trees. That's their preference but they also eat leaves. And it turns out that chimps will eat meat, but they don't get it often, and they're not very successful hunters. But, and, one, and this is a curious detail about chimps that I happen to like. Uh, um, I will digress, forgive me, I can't help myself. Uh, um, chimps uh, have territories, they're territorial, they feed within their territory, and uh, they share the territory with the gorillas, uh, so uh, they have to go far afield often to get what they need, and if they see another chimp from a different band, they will threaten them. They will not attack them unless they can outnumber that chimp. They will not engage in conflict unless they're assured of victory, of success. So uh, two chimps that are on the borderline of their territory, they'll uh, make gestures and whatnot, but they will not engage. If they're two on one side, they will attack. I thought that was interesting, uh, um, but it's a footnote. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, one of the things that uh, I found interesting that I discovered in this food stuff is the notion of unintended consequences and that uh, uh, some evolutionary development over here will have an impact and ramifications on, in something completely unrelated. And, and that's the case with uh, the development of uh, bipedalism. Um, the, there was climate change seven million years ago, and the 
jungle, the forest in which these primates lived. Um, and our ancestors had brain sizes approximately the same as chimps and orangutans. Um, the forest uh, uh, got smaller, it was drier, and the development of savannas and the, uh, the primates that came out of that uh, um, forest started walking. And no one knows how that happened, okay? It's a mystery, okay? There's theories. Uh, one of the theories is that uh, some of the tree um, inhabiting primates reached up for fruit. And in that reaching up, they developed this reaching up phenomena. And there, there, there have been about 30 or 40 different kinds of upright primates that came out of the, the forest. And some of them, not some, all of them uh, uh, became extinct. Only one of those uh, uh, jungle primates evolved to become us, okay? Our ancestors. Uh, one of the theories for um, the, the uh, bipedalism is that uh, in the savanna, the high grasses required uh, a height to be able to look over the top of the uh, foliage and uh, um, for protection against uh, predators. Being in trees is one of the ways that they uh, protected themselves. They no longer had the trees to climb into. And uh, we have, the evidence that we have from this era is all bones. It's all skulls and uh, skeletons. And uh, the way that uh, we've been able to observe the transition from uh, being uh, vegetarians to being uh, omnivores has been through the teeth. And that uh, um, uh, herbivores like the gorillas, they have molars. They don't have the incisors and the canines. Uh, and the, the, uh, our, the ancestors that specialized in a particular diet, they didn't survive. The, the one species that survived were the ones that became omnivorous and generalists. Uh, um, one way of looking at omnivory is that they can eat in any environment. They can, uh, uh, because they can eat uh, plants as well as animals, or insects, or fish, or you know any. The, the, the nature of omnivory is one of the unintended consequences of this uh, uh, evolutionary development. So other unintended consequences of bipedalism is that the hands were freed up. And all of a sudden, there's this new, new opportunities present themselves just because of the hands being freed up. Also, the, uh, one of the features of uh, bipedalism is being able to move around. Uh, um, chimps can't go very far at any given time because they need, uh, um, they can't walk upright. They need uh, at least one other limb to mobilize. Um, so one of the unintended consequences of bipedalism is that uh, the hands were free to carry. And Jane Lancaster, who's a professor at, at UNM, is the person who did a lot of the pioneering work on the hands being freed up. Uh, um, chimps and, and uh, other primates, they have food share, but they're unsuccessful at being able to carry stuff back to their uh, nests. While these are bipedal ancestors, they were more successful because they could actually carry stuff. So food sharing was uh, facilitated by this development. And here's the theory on how omnivory developed. They suspect that it happened in the Rift Valley in Africa, which is Kenya and Eastern Africa. And 
they, that's where they found uh, Lucy, and they found a lot of the uh, uh, skeletons of our ancestors. And they looked at the geology, and they observed that in the stratification of the Earth, there were uh, rapid successions of droughts and floods. Uh, uh, droughts and floods. So uh, 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 compressed over several million years, there were these major climate changes. And as a result, the primates had to adapt to survive. And their adaptation took the form of being able to eat whatever was available. So over a two million year period of time between bipedalism and fire, uh, omnivory occurred. Okay. And now, the thing about evolution is that it's slow. So these developments are imperceptible from generation to generation, which is still true. Year, two million years ago, uh, one million eight hundred thousand years ago, they found evidence of fire, of cooking, and curiously enough, it corresponds, it correlates with the early chip tools. And I suspect that what happened is when you strike flints and make arrowheads and knives out of the flints, you also get sparks. So there was this uh, a double benefit of making these tools. It also allowed them to start controlling making fire. And, and, and the research for this is done by a guy named Richard Wrangham, teaches at Harvard, one of my heroes. Uh, and his book is called Catching Fire, which is amazing. When they started using fire, it was literally a revolution. And in the bone evidence, the skeletal evidence, the brain sizes started expanding at uh, um, a significant amount. So the brain development from uh, the, the forest to bipedalism, it was gradual and it was uh, not that significant, but every time these ancestors did something different, like walk up, it required more brain. Using their hands, more brain. Throwing required more brain. Running. Humans are the best runners in the animal world. Okay, We don't sprint as fast as other animals, but we are long distance runners, and we're the most successful runners. So that's another unintended consequence of bipedalism. And why that's important is because um, in this transition to uh, omnivory and to the use of tools and fire, the ancestors started hunting. And they became hunters. And that was uh, a significant revolution because uh, the, one of the theories about the development of meat eating is that they were scavengers and that they would find the uh, leftovers of uh, other predators and, uh, you know, uh, like hyenas or uh, vultures carrion, and that that was part of the evolution of eating meat, is that they would eat uh, um, small animals or leftover carcasses till they were able to hunt themselves. So. Uh, um, Fire allowed them also, allowed them to create protection so that they could sleep on the ground uh, and keep predators away. And now this is another one of those cool things that I like that I, I, you know, it, it's not food related, but like sitting around the uh, campfire, having a fire, it allowed them to start looking at each other. Most animals don't make eye contact because it's threatening. You know that with dogs? And, and uh, um, monkeys, chimps, apes, they don't do a lot of eye contact because it's uh, uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, sitting around the fire uh, is speculated that that allowed 
uh, the ancestors to look at each other um, the way I'm looking at you, okay, without it being a threat. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Fire also um, starts, there's an unintended quant uh, uh, consequence to bipedalism, which has to do with reproduction, which is that all the other mammals have easy births. Any parents in here? Okay. Uh, um, the upright uh, primate has challenging births because uh, uh, um, it affected the uh, uterus and the passage of babies. And uh, we are the species that loses the most babies historically, which is distressing. It's an unintended consequence of being bipedal. So there are positive aspects to bipedalism and there have been some challenging consequences. Um, the whole uh, uh, deal with the large brain is that uh, it made it harder to give birth. So around this time as the brain expands uh, um, uh, it and one of the reasons that it expands is because a large portion of our brain is attuned to social behavior. Uh, a large part of our brain is attuned to status. Um, the primates have alphas, and they have hierarchies, and there's stratification amongst the uh, primates. And one of the things that occurred in between this period here, two million years ago, is uh, um, the hunter-gatherer bands started developing. So they got these bigger brains, they're hunting, they got challenging uh, reproduction, they lose babies. And, and one of the theories by Sarah Hardy from Harvard is that it was because of these challenging births that women came together, the females, I shouldn't say women, the females came together to coach each other, and that that was one of the origins of cooperation. So that the, the male perspective on this has always been that cooperation developed around hunting, and so a feminist, of course, uh, uh, challenged that and uh, put forth a different idea. I think they probably happened simultaneously. Also, the theory of the development of language occurred around the campfire. They were making eye contact and they were also communicating with each other with symbolic language. And that a lot of the language uh, originally had to, the thought was, the theory was that uh, they needed language to organize the hunt and organize how they were gonna uh, collectively pursue their game and a, 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 a more recent theory is that they needed language to divvy up the kill and how they were going to portion the, uh, the meat. So, fire, bigger brain. One of the theories of the division of labor between men and uh, males and females occurs around the fire that the females, because they had the children and they had the larger brain and they had the longer childhood, they would keep the fire going while the males went off and did their hunting. So our species, us, Homo sapiens, uh, we've spent most of our time on the planet as hunter-gatherers in tribal groups and we're attuned to that kind of, we're wired to be attuned to the social status of uh, tribes. And typically, that's been uh, uh, by and large egalitarian. And um, if there's a kill, everyone in the tribe gets a share. And, and this is still the case in tribes um, in uh, 
Washington State Indian tribes in uh, uh, Oregon, uh, that part of Canada, uh, when they bring in a, uh, a big fish, like a whale, they'll divvy it up, and ev everyone has their share. And in the Odyssey and the Iliad, when the Greeks uh, uh, sacrificed cows, everyone got their share. Uh, and it was uh, decided ahead of time. It wasn't random. It was an allocation. So it was culturally acceptable and agreed upon. Now, this egalitarian thing, it lasted a long time. And the a uh, golden age of human digestion occurred just before domestication, uh, um, about 15,000 years ago. And the evidence is in the bones. The evidence is that we had uh, tall, healthy bones, and the theory is, is that everything was edible, and uh, um, there were several migrations out of Africa, and the entire planet got populated. Um, there are theories about why that happened, and it's food-related, and it has to do with uh, successful reproduction, and that uh, people, the tribes, uh, outgrew their territories for uh, harvesting and foraging and hunting, so they had to uh, migrate. And there are all kinds of great food-related theories on how they migrated. Some of them have to do with uh, a climate change and herds of animals migrating and these uh, upright uh, hunter-gatherers following the herds as they moved into Asia and Europe. And from the bone records, there, there were two major uh, um, Exoduses, diasporas uh, out of Africa, uh, one earlier and one later. But the upshot is uh, by about uh, 60,000 years ago, uh, there were uh, people living in the Arctic, there were people living in Australia, there were people living, the, the, the planet got uh, inundated by our species. Okay, now we get into the interesting stuff. This is just the, the foundation to get into the domestication of plants and animals. The, the theory here is that there were climate changes, uh, there were all these migrations, and uh, three or four things happened simultaneously in different parts of the planet. Um, in Anatolia, which is modern Turkey and the Fertile Crescent, um, they started, uh, they discovered grains, uh, uh, wheat, bulgur, millet, um, and one of the, one of the uh, and, and it probably wasn't a big part of their uh, diet, uh, one, of the, one of the theories coming out of University of Cincinnati is that uh, uh, there was a bowl with some cereal, and it fermented. It became beer, and uh, they tasted the beer, and they liked it. <laughs> and they call it the beer theory of civilization. Another phenomena, and th these things probably all happened uh, um, concurrently, uh, is that uh, um, Dogs were probably the first domesticated animals, and the speculation there is that they were human-friendly. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, the wolves. Okay, they, these would be wolves that followed the hunts and uh, scavenged off the carcasses of uh, human hunt, and that these wolves would sort of just track the humans, and they were uh, probably didn't bark a lot, and they were probably uh, you know predisposed to being docile and happy to uh, feed off the humans. Uh, um, that kind of critter is a kind of parasite. And uh, it's speculated to today that dogs are parasites and that um, they live off of us. This is not to insult Sorry. dogs. <laughs> <laughs>
so so dogs probably uh, uh, dogs originate from wolves, and and that's the speculation in the and the theory is that uh, um, they coexisted and they developed. I just mean from what you've said so far, humans are parasites too. Then. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you know what? We all feed off of each other. You know, one of the uh, uh, arguments uh, um, against uh, meat eating is that there's a it's unequal that we're eating meat. But Gary Snyder says, but eventually we become the meal, and we will get eaten. Um, I'll leave that alone for right now. <laughs> okay. So uh, um, let's talk about horses. The horses were domesticated in uh, um, Eastern Asia in the steppes. And what I found provocative about the domestication of horses is that uh, there's um, Professor Shepard um, theorizes that the origin of the domestication of horses is what led to the uh, female becoming second-class citizens, becoming uh, subservient to males, and the rise of the patriarchy and also the rise of slavery and warfare. That once the horses were domesticated, the humans had control over their reproduction, control over their life and death. They were used um, as uh, labor, and um, it was a model that allowed the uh, those um, those horse riders to control the reproduction and labor of their females. Also because they uh, um, developed a sense of ownership. Uh, horses were property and uh, that had not existed amongst the hunter-gatherers. The hunter-gatherers were egalitarian because they were moving around, they were nomadic they didn't have the wherewithal to have possessions that uh, would slow them down when they traveled. And all of a sudden, with uh, the emergence of domestication of plants and animals, ownership and property became a phenomenon. With uh, plants, it meant that the land that they grew things on became property. And they started developing uh, uh, sedentary lifestyles that uh, required they be in place to receive the crops. And the sedentary landscape, uh, um, housing, was a revolutionary phenomena that changed our species. And a lot of uh, the uh, stratification of society that we are familiar with today originated with the domestication of the plants and the animals. It changed reproduction. Now, uh, uh, um, in hunter-gathering uh, people, if you have a baby, you're slowed down. You can't move fast, and you won't reproduce if you're still nursing. And uh, um, these human babies required uh, three to four years before they could fend for themselves in any kind of form. So they were profoundly dependent on their mothers and the tribe. So the whole nature of, of reproduction was turned on its head. The, in hunter-gatherers, the separation between children is uh, between uh, three, four, and five years. With uh, uh, living in uh, one place, the females could reproduce uh, uh, every 18 months. But we know that what's known as Irish twins. You've heard of those? Okay. That couldn't happen amongst uh, hunter-gatherers, or it didn't. Uh, so all of a sudden, there's an explosion of population at this time. Uh, and one of the phenomena uh, th that, cro that uh, crosses from uh, uh, the beginning of bipedalism is uh, the migration. And now the migration went into cities. And this period here, um, 
from uh, 15,000 years ago to about uh, 4,000 years ago was uh, a, a process of urbanization. Uh, the word civilization itself comes from civic, which means city. So uh, urbanization is, is the trend that uh, began in earnest around this time and is still happening today. And today, we've passed the point of um, between rural and urban. And there are fewer people that are living in rural areas and more people living in cities. And that's part of the hyper-social nature of our species. In other words, we can't help ourselves. However, one of the other phenomena uh, about tribes is that tribes uh, uh, work as units and they're, they cooperate with other tribes, but they will also be in conflict with other tribes. So the, uh, um, the other and the foreigner and the one that we will fight with for resources has increased over time. So uh, um, with urbanization and civilization, um, one of the things that happened as a result of this is that uh, surpluses were created. They were able to grow more food and they were able to have uh, protein because they had herds and the population grew and not as many people had to work on the farms uh, or be farmers. They could have soldiers, but they could also have artists um, and priests and ownership of property and all of stratification originates there and we're still living in that paradigm. This is, uh, this is um, a strange phenomena that both agrees with us and does not agree with us. Uh, at, at a biological level, I would argue, because um, I do believe that we have that uh, uh, hunter-gatherer egalitarian nature, and we also have this uh, status-seeking nature. So these are uh, um, a piece of our inner uh, conflict. It's my theory. Now we're in the territory that you're all probably familiar with, with uh, the Egyptians and the Sumerians and the Greeks, the, the <clears throat> Philistines, the Hebrews in the Middle East and China, and India, and uh, Mesoamerica, and the Aztecs, and the Maya, and the pyramids. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, these empires uh, were built on um, slave labor, animal labor, and slave labor. And this is a function of uh, the fact that uh, they could. You know, it, it, uh, I wish I could explain it better, but it, So one part of the world, are you familiar with Jared Diamond? Uh, um, guns, germs, and steel. Uh, his theory is as a result of the transmission of uh, packets of agricultural um, uh, seeds, domesticated animals, that uh, people could adopt these things quickly and that it would move across the same latitude because the uh, climate would lend itself to the exchange of these packages of nutrition across the continent. And uh, the European folks developed uh, um, the weapons, and they outgrew their ability to feed themselves, and so they sent out boats to uh, seek the spice trade and other sources of uh, food. Um, and that's when we come to the exchange. Another way of uh, 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 characterizing the exchange is colonialism. 
Okay, exchange is sort of neutral and sounds friendly, like we're trading things. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of brutal. And uh, there was all, you know, the conquest of the planet by the European nations and colonialism, and we're still dealing with that. Uh, what happened is that, uh, who here likes potatoes? Do you know where the wild potato comes from? Do you know where the wild tomato comes from? The, uh, uh, the, the source, your origin of the wild tomato, you, wh wh where would you think? The wild uh, tomato and the wild potato come from Peru. So when you, when you dunk your French fried potato into ketchup, you're having a Peruvian combo. Yeah. Okay. The, the Europeans, the Italians, didn't see a tomato till the Renaissance. Okay. The tomato did not exist in Italy till it was brought over. The Irish did not see a potato till it was brought over. Uh, uh, during the exchange, chocolate, coffee, uh, all these things. Uh, the, the coffee comes from uh, 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 Arabia, okay, but it didn't like penetrate till around the, the Renaissance. And uh, um, sugar. Let's talk about sugar. Who knows where the wild sugar comes from? The the original sugar. Uh, uh, it comes from. Uh, was now Indonesia, all right? It was from the uh, Spice Islands, and it migrated to uh, the Middle East. So in the Middle East, they had sugar. There's a, a city uh, in uh, uh, Jordan called uh, Sukar, and that's where the name sugar came from. And um, they, the only place in Europe where sugar cane will grow is the very southern part of Spain. Okay, and in the Middle Ages, sugar was rare and it was super expensive, and only the nobles could eat sugar. And it, it's theorized that uh, Elizabeth, the Queen of England, she had rotten teeth because she had access to sugar. So all the portraits of her have her mouth closed. So nobility could enjoy sugar, and it was used as a spice. And gradually, sugar increased. And what we've seen from the Middle Ages to the present is uh, uh, a curve like this of the intake of sugar on the planet. Uh, um, we are wired to like sugar, okay? Uh, uh, salty, uh, bitter, sour, pungent, and sweet. Those are the five flavors that our tongues are receptive to. And uh, it's kind of like from our uh, living in the trees and grasping for the fruit, we still grasp for the fruit and we still grasp for the sugar. So um, it went from only the nobles, only the wealthy, the middle, uh, the middle class couldn't afford it. It was, uh, it, was too ex it was too rare, too expensive. And little by little with the colonialization, they took all those uh, sugar canes and planted them in the Caribbean, in Hispaniola, in Haiti, in uh, Jamaica. Um, when the Europeans came to those islands, they brought diseases. And uh, the chronicles of Columbus are about bringing disease and slaughter. And literally, the indigenous people on those islands were uh, um, genocided. And they put in uh, of these uh, sugar canes. Now they needed labor to work these plantations and they brought slaves from Africa. So the original slaves, the very first uh, uh, slave labor was uh, to supply labor for the um, plantations. So this sugar became less expensive. It became a, a commodity crop, and it was uh, available to regular people. And one of the, uh, some of the people that it was available to were the
factory workers in England. What was happening concurrently with this development of these plantations were the European, uh, um, uh, the, uh, you, the farmers, that eluded me for a second, the farmers were being displaced off their land. Uh, there were uh, um, food shortages. This is one of the reasons why they were looking for these uh, new continents, is that there was uh, um, starvation going on in Europe. Um, and there was this uh, push by the landlords to push the peasants off their land. And these peasants were moving to the city, that urbanization phenomena, and the place that they could find work were the emerging factories. And so to feed these factory workers, they were supplying them with sugar from the Caribbean that was inexpensive, and the way they were giving it to them was with tea. So they were, the, the colonies in Asia were supplying the tea, which is a stimulant, and they were combining it with the sugar from the Caribbean to keep these workers going. So this is another form of labor exploitation that was uh, um, being fueled by the food that was available, which was the sugar and the um, tea. Another phenomena was that uh, the poor people in England, they were living literally on jam, okay, bread and jam. It was one of the ways that the sugar took its uh, form. Um, and there are descript this is in Dickens now. We're talking about Dickens. And in Dickens, the, the, the father, the male, he got some meat. Nobody else in the family. So the father ate different than the kids and then uh, and the women. Okay, so these distinctions have carried on from uh, the earliest days of uh, domestication. And um, the division of labor between uh, males and females uh, um, has its origins with the fire. When the men would go off and hunt, the women kept the fire. They had their kids. They couldn't, they weren't as mobile. But all throughout, women were providing a great deal of diet, just the smaller creatures. They, they created nets. They uh, uh, made fish nets. There are really cool examples on the coasts of uh, the ingenuity of uh, catching fish. They make spirals with uh, um, branches, and they make spirals. The water would come in with the high tide, the fish would swim in there, the water would recede, and there'd be fish that were caught in the, in the uh, traps. All righty then. So here we are, we're at the exchange. It's the impact of colonialism. Uh, uh, it's still occurring. What's happened is in the countries where the uh, uh, colonial powers took over, they enslaved the local population. Um, and there were major famines in India in the 1880s. Uh, um, Millions, literally millions, like 28 million, 30 million uh, people died in these famines because the British extracted the crops to feed the British. And the same happened during the, uh, with the Irish. Uh, the, the reason that the potato was so successful in uh, Ireland is because uh, it would grow in places where in infertile land. It could, it, it could prosper in land that would not uh, be suited for wheat or other crops. And when you combine milk, a dairy product, with a potato, it's a complete protein. So you could uh, survive on potatoes and dairy, which is a nice feature. However, they monocropped. And in the 1840s, there was a blight. There was a fungus that wiped out the potato harvest and millions died there. And that was one of the impetuses for the mass migrations migration, out of Europe into this continent. Uh, and what happened here is that we had an abundance 
of wild game. We had an abundance of protein, meat. And today, there are entire species that are gone as a result of these migrations that came here to eat. And our history as a country is fascinating. There's uh, several schools of uh, um, our dietary heritage. Um, there's the Puritan. Uh, the Puritans, the, the, the evidence for this is Cotton Mather's uh, medical texts. And his uh, medical texts, the cure to everything, literally everything, is to throw up, okay? Is vomiting, is upchucking. Okay? And those Puritans uh, um, had a law that was the law in, this, in uh, New England, in the Americas, up until the 1880s, where one day a month there was a fast and no one would eat. Okay? That was reversed in the 1880s, but that is the Puritan mindset. And contrasting that is the gorging, is the excess eating. Um, so there are these two... Uh, schools of thought in the Americas uh, between um, overeating and undereating, which I, I see today, currently, is still a phenomenon. So I want to draw a line from fire to uh, when we urbanized to ovens, to today, the microwave. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the uh, continuum of the cooking line. And any of these uh, phenomena we can take from here to here uh, and draw the, uh, the evolution of any of the phenomena. Uh, um, with technology, it started with the flints. Okay, and bows and arrows. Uh, um, when you get to here, it, it, it's with uh, the harness for the animals, with the plants. Uh, it's the plow, and there are these different developments. So you go from uh, the plow, which is made of wood, to the plow, which is made of metal, to the tractor. Uh, and now we have automiz everything is automized. Is that the right word? Uh, um, today, the tractor has a guy sitting in it who's reading a book because they got GPS and the tractor is run by the GPS and the, the land has been leveled with uh, laser leveling. Uh, everything is automated. There are people that have gardens in this neighborhood, okay, um, near the golf course, near the law school, and they got timers on their sprinklers and they can be visiting uh, a, a different continent, and uh, with their phone, they're uh, making sure that their garden is uh, adequately hydrated, okay? okay. Uh, um, I would suspect, how many people here have gardens? Okay, uh, two out of 10. Right, so uh, um, I'm extrapolating from the fact that about three percent of the population feeds the rest of the population in this country. Okay, which means that y'all, except for the gardeners, you all are getting your food in a supermarket. Okay, you're all you're not foraging, you're not hunting, you're not growing, and that there's a part of our um, omnivorous tribal biology that's only function is food acquisition. And that that part of the brain, which is in the lizard part of the brain, which is, doesn't articulate with language, is depressed. Because it's not involved in food acquisition, which is its job. Okay, and that going to the supermarket is a pale uh, um, effort in terms of food acquisition. And I would submit to you guys that are gardening, you have a different relationship because uh, you're touching the earth, 
you're feeling and observing your plant's growth, and you're eating stuff that you grew yourself, and I, I, I think it's qualitatively different, uh, um, because when we take a tomato from a shelf in the supermarket, we have no idea what the conditions were of the people that picked it. We have no idea if they had outhouses or not, okay? Uh, we have no idea if they were being exploited, or maybe machines picked them. The, the battle that's going on in New Mexico with uh, the genetically modified chili is not to change the flavor of the chili, not to change uh, uh, its taste characteristics, it's to make it easier for machines to harvest it. I'm just saying. And, and uh, um, that's the trend, is uh, mechanization, I just watched a video of bread making in an industrial uh, plant, and there's no people. It's all machines, and they they uh, you know they they do everything mechanically, and and they produce tons of food. And our food today. is heavily subsidized by the government. And nobody really knows what the true cost of food is. And today, our food is not our friend anymore. And that's the crisis that we're living in. And one of the theories uh, of uh, industrialization in terms of the next step is the return to other methods of um, food production. I'm going to tell you a real quick story, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, um, who here has ever driven by a CAFO, uh, um, which is the industrial cow feedlots? Okay, what does this smell like? Okay, okay, it stinks. Okay, let's be clear, all right? Uh, and, and here's the thing, is that uh, 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 something that stinks of that nature is, is an indication that uh, it's unpleasant and it shouldn't happen. Okay, so here, here's the origin of the, uh, the cows being uh, penned that way. Uh, after, during World War II, they stockpiled sodium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrate. And, and that's an explosive. That's part of what uh, McVeigh used in Oklahoma City as an explosive. Um, when the war ended, they had to figure out a way of getting rid of these stockpiles, and they were massive. And so some uh, um, administrators in Washington, D.C., they decided, well, why don't we sell it cheap as fertilizer in the Midwest? And they did. And as a result, there were bumper crops of corn in the, the late 40s, in 48, 49, 50, 50. There were these you know, masses of uh, corn that they didn't know what to do with. They had a surplus. So some other bright guys, probably, white guys, probably, they are not corn eaters. However, they decided that's what they do. And the most efficient way of feeding them the corn was creating these feedlots with troughs, and they fed the corn to the cows. Because they were aggregated that way, they were standing in their own manure, they were prone to diseases. So they gave them antibiotics. And you see how these unintended consequences occur as a result of one decision made by another? I'm going to go back. I got another story I want to tell you because I think it's pretty cool. Is uh, you familiar with serfs in the Middle Ages? Mm -hmm. What is a someone tell me what a serf is? What's your definition of a serf? In this food research I've been doing, I discovered the origin of serfdom, and the curious thing is, is that I've researched seeking out. How did this happen? How did serfs occur? And, and, and this is what I found, and, and it's not widely understood, and it's not widely represented in the literature, which is shocking. Uh, um, in 
335 AD, the Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire, they were having uh, uh, climate fluctuations and there were droughts and peasants, farmers were leaving the land and going into the cities. Okay? And he proclaimed, he made a proclamation, he made a law uh, by dictate that the firstborn sons of farmers could not leave the land. So they were required to stay on the land. Uh, when the uh, uh, Goths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Germanic tribes that overran the uh, Roman Empire, when they came into power, they liked that uh, uh, social structure, and they kept it because those farmers were Celts. So they were the other. They were not of the same tribe. And it was a way of maintaining the Roman system that they admired, and that's how those uh, people became serfs. And it perpetuated till uh, 1865 in Russia. Serfdom existed for a thousand years. And it was all because of an unintended consequence of a farm policy. I thought that was pretty interesting. All right, so here we are today. And uh, uh, I believe we're in the midst of a food revolution um, that uh, we don't have articulated in a, a way that uh, makes sense uh, from an activist perspective. We got vegans, we got people that are into organics, we got uh, um, paleo, we got all these things that are contesting with each other. And one of the reasons that I uh, uh, claim any expertise whatsoever in my field is because I've discovered that two of the big authorities in this world, the French Larousse and the, uh, the uh, British, I forgot what they call it, the, the, uh, the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Food, they contradict each other. Okay, they don't agree. So these two major authorities are in disagreement, which allows for me to have a third opinion <laughs> and, and to uh, uh, claim, if you guys can't agree on this, well, I, my uh, opinion is valid. Uh, um, I want to tell you the story of the origin of the croissant. Who here is eat, eats croissants? OK. Melissa B., do you eat croissants? Oh, yes. Okay. You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, the Ottoman Empire is laying siege to Vienna, okay? And uh, I believe the date is 1648, but it could be 1684, one of those. Um, They've been sieging Vienna for a year, and they haven't managed to conquer it. And uh, one night, the Turks decide, we're going to uh, do a sneak attack. They, they're not going to expect this. And during the night, they were um, mobilizing and surrounding the city for this attack. And the bakers were awake, because they were baking. And they heard this, and they alerted the authorities. And the authorities repulsed the Turks, and the Turks uh, backed off, and to commemorate this event and to honor the bakers, they created the croissant, which is the crescent moon on the Turkish flag. You ever see the Turkish flag? It's a crescent, all right? So when we eat croissants, we're symbolically consuming the <laughs> Turkish enemy. All right, just a cultural tidbit. All right, I'm I'm done for now. Any questions?